It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here with a special series brought to you by the NEI Podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmastology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts, with one part released each month. The next theme is on Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid hypothesis, disease modification, and breakthroughs in diagnosis and treatment. Today, Dr. Andy Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the current state of Alzheimer's disease and the amyloid controversy. Let's listen in to part one of our theme, Alzheimer's disease and the amyloid controversy. Welcome to another edition of the Psychopharmacology Show, the NEI podcast series with Dr. Stephen Stahl. And today's edition is Alzheimer's disease and the amyloid controversy. Well, Steve, this certainly is pretty topical, is it not? My seat is already hot from the controversy (laughs) heating up beneath us. It sure is. Alzheimer's obviously is a devastating illness, incredibly common and growing as people age in our country. And, you know, over my research career, Steve, there has been a ton of research done on Alzheimer's. And I feel like we've made very small sort of incremental gains despite throwing lots of money at this. What do you think's going on here? Well, I don't think we have the pathophysiology. We fell in love with the idea that Amyloid was bad, and if you stopped amyloid, you'd fix this illness, simply, you know, oversimplifying. And although mm-hmm. there is, what we have learned, I think, over the years, I mean, I don't know if this, how long ago you were trained, Eddie, but I'm an old guy with, with <laughs> white hair, and so the, that which is left. And we used to think it was atherosclerosis. We used to think that it was hardening of the arteries caused dementia in the 1960s and 1970s. And You know, then the idea that this dementia was was caused by something other than cardiovascular disease. I mean, there is a vascular component, of course. That's one of the advances. And then the idea is that there are several types of dementia, whether it's, you know, frontotemporal or a Lewy body. That was, you know, got, got to be part of the things we've learned. And certainly the imaging has been part of it. And since as imaging gets worse with amyloid, so goes dementia. They figured if you stopped the amyloid in the images that you'd stop dementia. And it's been very hard to actually show that because there's been a lot of ways to stop amyloid, almost all of which has been either negative or controversial. Yeah, it sure has. I guess what we're referring to is kind of the two hallmark neuroimaging features of Alzheimer's disease are these senile amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles inside the cells, if you will, both of which are probably neurotoxic. And I guess the question really is, are they cause or symptom or <laughs> byproduct, if you will? Right. And I think, well, you know, I, you know, think, I think people yeah. who, are, who they grew up in the era of, of the revolution of statins in statins prevented cholesterol forming into plaques. And they thought that's just the same thing. So, you know, there's, there's this cholesterol was a bad thing. You lower cholesterol you, and you don't have cardiovascular disease. Amyloid's a bad thing stop amyloid, you wouldn't have Alzheimer's. So that's where the idea came from. Yeah. A lot of people think, though, that it's almost like the horse is out of the barn. You know, normal, healthy aging brains do have some amyloid in them. And the thinking is when you've built up this much amyloid, it may be too far down the pathway. All right. I mean, there's, you talk about some things, the horse, the horse, the cows are out of the barn or whatever. I'll give you another one. Is it basically Alzheimer's is caused by amyloid or amyloid is caused by Alzheimer's? <laughs> so, right. and another way to put it right. is that tombstones, I've already used like this analogy, tombstones are caused by people dying. But if you stopped all the tombstones from being made in the world, you would not stop anybody dying. Or civilization is, is actually, basically makes garbage. And civilizations die and change over time. So does the garbage of the civilization mm-hmm. cause that? You know, no, it's a byproduct of it. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. And so this is the worry is that this is after you have Alzheimer's disease, the epiphenomenon is to create these plaques and tangles, which are certainly no good. But if you mm-hmm. stop them from being formed, the primary 
precursor cause of really why the brain is dying goes merrily along its way. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. I heard a comedian recently along the lines of what you were just saying, Steve, saying the number one cause of death is birth. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah but, everybody, uh, everybody with Alzheimer's disease has been born and they're all going to die. That's right. And so, that's you know, right. the problem is you can actually take amyloid out of the brain. Now. And right. these last two drugs that have come out, we'll get to that, I'm sure, you know, basically suck it out by antibodies, essentially. And there's mm-hmm. ways to stop it being formed in the first place by having you know enzymes that, that stop the amyloid plaque formation. And it's all controversial. And I think that what's ended up happening is that we so fell in love with this hypothesis that the FDA, so what'd they say? We don't have to show that they get better. All you have to show is you stopped amyloid because we're absolutely sure that amyloid causes Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, the trials that were done right. were often to show that amyloid was gone, not to show that mm-hmm. dementia was even reversed, God forbid, which has never mm-hmm. happened or slowed down. Yeah, let's get into this a little bit. These last two drugs that were approved, of course, there was Acanumab, which was extremely controversial, and largely because the while, of course, it did clear out the amyloid, the clinical benefit was really marginal. And the thinking is that there was so much pressure to approve something that this one got approved. And the problem is these drugs are going to be very expensive. Well, yeah. And so the new one is Lemicamadab or something like that? Or what, how do you pronounce mm-hmm. that? Lecanumab. Uh, yeah, like Hanuman. And so that one actually had somewhat of a improvement after not 12 months, but after 18 months, I believe, there was some slowing mm-hmm. That's of the right. rate of decline. And so that right. had more than just removing amyloid. It actually had a little bit of a hint. I did some math. You know, I'm not very good at all these fancy amyloid concepts, okay, but I can count. And so if $26,000 is the cause of the, is the co- price that was just announced, I think yesterday or this week about the new one. And if you only have, oh, let's say 5 million people have Alzheimer's disease in, in, in the United States going to 10. And uh, that doesn't even count the fact that MCI with amyloid on a scan can get actually get this drug now before you're actually, frankly, demented. So that's another 5 million. So let's say half the people get it. You know what 5 million times 26,000 is? times, say, a, a lifespan of five years, if that's what you want to guess, something like $650 oh, billion wow. dollars to treat yeah. half the people with Alzheimer's disease. So, yeah. you know, this is going to be a problem. That, you know, I mean, I understand $26,000 is, is important for the value of a life year. You know, they have these ideas in pharmacoeconomics about, you know, the, what the value of a year of life is. Now, of course, by, by the way, I'm not sure mine is more or less valuable than yours, Andy. I mean, I'm sure your life year is much more valuable <laughs> than one of mine. But to any, whatever it is, it's impossible mm-hmm. to actually think that we can treat the, the population that could demand this. No, I certainly agree. And uh, what you're referring to, of course, is that this new one, Lecanemab, over 18 months showed a little bit of a slowing, a little less decline, as like, as like you said, I mean, this drug did not improve anything. It just slowed the decline by a really small amount on a dementia rating scale, the CDR sum of boxes. And, you know, what does that translate into as far as quality of life? We don't know if this prolongs life. We don't know if it really improves quality of life. Is that very small difference in decline clinically meaningful? Does that mean the person will be functional longer? Very un- unclear and unlikely, to be honest. So you know, I, think, I like guess the question is, is, is it small because the knock-on effect of making amyloid after you've already got Alzheimer's from another cause doesn't do your brain any good and makes you decline mm-hmm. worse? So that secondary mm-hmm. worsening is all that you actually get improvement from by sucking amyloid out of your brain? But the, meanwhile, mm-hmm. whatever is really causing Alzheimer's disease and generating these neurons before you form it into amyloid, is merrily going on its way. Exactly. Exactly. And I think you said it best when you said we sort of fell in love with this amyloid hypothesis because we finally understood something about this disease. But I think the pathophysiology is way more complicated and has been way harder to elucidate. Although my sense is from looking at the various drugs that are in development now, we've got a lot of really interesting mechanisms that we're attacking here. So I actually feel like if we can get past this amyloid detour, we're really going to get somewhere. Well, lots of luck on that. I've sat in many advisory boards and then got kicked off of most of them over time because I'm a naysayer (laughs) about this hypothesis, or at least I'm trying (laughs) to give the devil's advocate point of view. 
it turns out that there's a lot of lack of critical thinking about whether this is what to do. It's all about, yeah, yeah we know we have to do this. What is that? Mm -hmm. Stop amyloid. Let's just find a way to do yeah. it and let's see if the clinical mm -hmm. trials. And nobody's really looking seriously at, well, maybe this is the wrong target. Uh, you say that mm -hmm. in a, even an advisory board in today's world, mm -hmm. you get looked at mm -hmm. like you're some sort of crazy person <laughs> or really a poorly yeah. informed. It's mm -hmm. really conventional wisdom that yeah, this is. amyloid causes Alzheimer's. Stopping amyloid stops Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Don't talk to me mm -hmm. about anything else. <laughs> Well, I think that we are slowly starting to get a little bit beyond this, though. There are, you know, there are, we've learned more about the pathophysiology. Obviously, just sucking all amyloid out doesn't touch the neurofibrillary tangle. So I am seeing some treatments directed at tau. But, you know, again, are we barking up the wrong tree with tau and neurofibrillary tangles? And so people are now looking at inflammation, various immune mechanisms, uh, insulin receptors in the brain, turns out those may be very involved here. Even really wacky things. There's a company, Steve, I don't know if you know about this. There's a theory that gingivitis may cause at least some cases of Alzheimer's, that there's a certain bacteria that can get up into the brain and can damage, it produces a toxin called gingipans that, that can damage nerve cells. And so there's a company developing an antitoxin against this toxin. And there's some preliminary evidence. That would You know what that, that reminds me of? You know that, that in the yeah. 1800s, there was yeah. a famous yeah. mental health hospital. I can't remember the name of it in New Jersey. Uh, or they thought uh -huh. this caused schizophrenia too. And so uh -huh. the uh, uh -huh. caretaker of this hospital, who was a psychiatrist at the time, had all the patient's mm -hmm. teeth pulled. Had the and teeth he was pulled, so yeah. convinced that this was yeah. a way to prevent schizophrenia that he had all his children's teeth pulled as well. Yeah. Oh, good. So wow. it didn't turn out that this was right for schizophrenia. I don't think it's going to turn no. out it was right for Alzheimer's. I'm sorry. Well, I, the I other do options. think it's a neurodegenerative problem. <clears throat> and I yes. think that there, there's something that's toxic about, about, about this. And it's not an inevitable consequence of aging. So it is an illness, not normal aging. But I, don't, right. I think we just have to be open-minded. And it certainly does your brain no good to have amyloid. The one good thing, I suppose, yeah. about this is that if you have amyloid and you have a little bit of cognitive problem, the chances of you getting Alzheimer's disease is much increased. So that's some diagnostic help. Unfortunately, if, I mean, it's a little bit like finding out you have the gene for Huntington's disease. There's not anything you can do about it. So part of it is you really want to know you have amyloid in your brain at age 70 when you don't have any cognitive decline or a little bit. And your well, brain's we, all, gonna... we all get some amyloid, and the issue is also there's abnormal processing of the amyloid that forms these oligomers. That those are the things apparently that are really toxic. So, you know, again, amyloid by itself may not be the issue, or at right. least the way we've looked at it. Yeah. Well, there's you a know, few Louis bodies and a little bit of stroke in most people who die in their 80s. That's right. And a little that's bit right. of Louis, yeah. Louis bodies here, and you know, that's the question right. is why are they there, and if you stop them forming, you're going to stop the problem, or mm -hmm. what's what occurs before these four? Right. And it's really probably a matter of how much and how much does the brain go down this aberrant pathway that creates too much of these things. Well, I hope the listeners so realize that this is a controversial podcast the way it's going, because I should be having yeah. a vigorous argument with you about how crazy I am about not even believing in the Alzheimer's. Even the people who lecture for us at the NEI academies and congresses and synapses and so forth, most of the experts that are neurologists working in the field and doing research are absolutely certain that amyloid hypothesis is good and they <laughs> spin these results quite differently than you and I are talking about it. So to be fair, I think mm. we're edging on the side of being more cynical yeah. about it than the average mm. top experts mm. would be. Much more bullish about this yeah. finding. No, I've been pretty, pretty low on this hypothesis for m many years because I've watched these drugs for years we've been doing this and it just hasn't seemed to make a big difference. You know, back to the uh, the teeth thing. All you got to do is take better care of your teeth, Steve. You don't have to pull them. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Gingivitis is preventable. Get that but floss anyway, back out, to huh? the, uh, Yeah, the floss out. But like I was saying, though, I think that there are some enlightened people now. I'm starting to see in here there are some people who are getting beyond this and who are starting to look farther upstream. And the fact is, of course, Steve, probably Alzheimer's like schizophrenia is not one thing. There's probably lots of different ways to catch Alzheimer's, if you will. Well, isn't the inflammation that is triggered by amyloid right. processing abnormalities? Certainly, we're getting into this whole idea of inflammation in central nervous system diseases, you know, in general, in schizophrenia and in mood disorders. It's not good to have inflammation in your brain. And is that triggered right. by something? And if you stopped it, 
then you wouldn't have the disease anymore. So mm-hmm. why would inflammation be triggered? Right. And I think neuroplasticity is the key to the game, obviously, too. What's inhibiting that? What's damaging that? You know, what's fascinating, there have been some studies showing that certain dietary lifestyle and lifestyle interventions can really make a dent in this condition. And some of the dietary interventions include highly anti-inflammatory foods or antioxidant foods such as berries, blueberries in particular, and the Mediterranean diet and exercise. So there well, there's something, something going that. on with insulin, isn't there? I mean, yes, the, the exactly. association That's right. type 2 diabetes right. and Alzheimer's disease is That's high. Right. And the question is, That's why right. is that? We used to think that the brain That's didn't right. respond at all to insulin. And it was basically, you know, it didn't do anything. Of course, insulin didn't get into the brain very well. But the issue is now that it does appear that the brain has some reactions to oh, yeah. insulin and certainly to oh, yeah. the metabolic state of people mm-hmm. who maybe that's what causes inflammation. Because when you have the metabolic syndrome, that's right. peripherally that's exactly from, right. you know, cholesterol and, you know, fat in your waist, et cetera, blood pressure changes, it is bad for your brain. No, Steve, that's 100% right. And that's an area that's very been very promising recently. I've seen there are some drugs that manipulate insulin receptors. The brain's loaded with insulin receptors, which is really curious. And it's involved in the inf- inflammation. It's involved in glucose utilization. The neurons need glucose, obviously, for energy. And uh, what's really fascinating, you know, our friend Roger McIntyre, of course, is working on these GLP-1 agonists, these drugs that are used for diabetes, incretins. He's looking at those for mood disorders, but it turns out they're very anti-inflammatory, very neuroprotective. And there are, these drugs are also being studied for Alzheimer's. Yeah, I think that there's, we should really investigate this seriously. Why are there insulin receptors in the brain? How is insulin related to a neurodegeneration or yes. the lack thereof and to inflammation? And I yes. think that that is something we've neglected to go into. But, I mean, why would there be insulin receptors in the brain if you can't get insulin into the brain? Is there another right. ligand that's right. endogenous that works at the insulin site that yes. we don't know about? Well, that's what et we cetera, think. Et cetera. That's what people think. That's exactly right. And again, yeah. it's still involved probably with energy metabolism and energy and glucose regulation, even though it may not be insulin specifically per se. So you're right. I mean, this is there's a lot we have to learn. There's a whole lot we have to learn here. I've seen some other really fascinating, you know, there's other ways of manipulating certain enzymes. There's other kinds of neuroprotection strategies. There's a lot of really interesting drugs and in developments. Many of them are very far away. They're in early phase studies. But I'm optimistic, Steve. I'm hopeful. Even within our lifetime, I'm hopeful. Well, you better get cracking because, you know, I know. those of us who are okay. at the pre-Alzheimer age level are, you know, waiting to make sure that we have that. Because uh, you mentioned it before, there's a difference between lifespan and health span. And Alzheimer's doesn't That's kill right. you right away. And one of the things, I don't know that we've talked this on this podcast or another one, but if you're not going to stop and halt, prevent or reverse Alzheimer's because we got the wrong target. What's going to happen? People are not mm-hmm. going to die of it. And what are they going to have? Mm-hmm. Behavioral symptoms. And so I mm-hmm. see what's going to happen is an explosion of psychosis associated with Alzheimer's, not just memory and agitation mm-hmm. associated with Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And of course, you, mm-hmm. you know that there are, are drugs coming out in all these areas. And yes. it could very well be that the quality of your life is going to be based upon having some of these, you know, difficult to manage problems in institutional settings, and they tend to make you get out of the family home, then go to an institution once you have them. So possibly Mm -hmm. some of these things would at least keep grandma in the back bedroom for a few more years. And so what's happening is non-disease modifying treatments of just behavioral symptoms of dementia are exploding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very hot. As you mentioned, there's several drugs I was consulting this morning with a pharmaceutical company that has a drug for agitation for dementia specifically. So there's a number of these. And then, as you said, the psychosis part, we know our friend Tim Avancerin has been looked at for that with some preliminary positive data, but so far hasn't been approved. Yeah. And the one the uh, drug that's caused all the, the hoo-ha in the field about muscarinic cholinergic oh. stimulation for mm-hmm. psychosis of schizophrenia is now in... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, develop for psychosis of dementia as well. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, actually. So you're right. And in some ways, it's analogous to autism. You know, we still don't understand the pathophysiology of autism. We don't have disease modifying agents, but we have agents approved to treat some of the behavioral symptoms. And that's made a difference. 
Yeah, that's uh, what we're going to have to go for as the lowest hanging fruit at this point. And then mm-hmm. I just have an open mind. I'll, I have an open mind too. I can be convinced. I was really glad mm-hmm. to see that the second antibody for Alzheimer's disease at least had some finding that yeah. it was yeah. improving. I think what that happened is that the FDA was convinced by how expensive it would be to make a drug company show that you had functional improvement over many years of a drug you don't even know it works yet. So they took what's right. called surrogate markers. That's kind of a sexy right. new idea for approval. Right. And in a way, that's actually what happened with cholesterol. So you didn't have to treat with an anti-cholesterol drug and count the number of heart attacks it saved, although that has mm-hmm. been done. All you had to do is you showed a lower cholesterol because it was mm-hmm. a surrogate market or a proxy. So lowered cholesterol means that you eventually won't have as many heart attacks. So they would approve drugs just on lowered cholesterol, although lowered cholesterol is asymptomatic. So mm-hmm. the same thing happened here. Is that, okay, amyloid right. is the bad agent, lower it, and we'll give you an approval. So the first drug did that with little signs that it actually had any functional change. They didn't maybe study it well enough or long enough. Second drug does mm-hmm. have some functional changes. Mm -hmm. So maybe Mm -hmm. those are worth pursuing. And I say maybe it's Mm -hmm. a secondary neurodegeneration that Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. occurs first, then Alzheimer causes, you know, amyloid, and that causes even more damage. And so maybe that secondary damage can be prevented. But what's the first? I think we have to keep our minds open. Yeah, we've got to get earlier in the sequence here, earlier in the pathway, farther upstream, if you will, or down upstream. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very interesting you mentioned that because, you know, it, it, it's just sucking the, again, just sucking the amyloid out of the brain without necessarily modifying the process just doesn't make sense to me. It's almost like the damage is already done. You've already killed a lot of nerve cells at that point. So, well, you know, you're not regenerating them necessarily. The horses, the cows are under the barn already. So once the, the right. brain is gone, it's gone. So. If there were a time in which amyloid was accumulating and the cells were only in distress, but Mm -hmm. not dead, maybe you could reverse that. But um, Well, I think that's the idea with this has been approved for earlier phase, you know, MCI and early Alzheimer's. So maybe that's the thinking. You know, you mentioned the statins, Steve. You know what's interesting there? A lot of people believe that the way statins actually work or a big part of how they work is not cholesterol, but anti-inflammatory. They're potent anti-inflammatories. Right. And so, so they you know, the one funny thing for the brain. Yeah. Is it going to be possible for us to find more selective inflammatories for the brain? Because right. the inflammation of the brain, we don't understand what are the exact mediators. Is it the same mm-hmm. as, you know, from any other cause in the periphery? And could we actually, you know, target it more specifically? It's right. something that hasn't been, you know, figured out, but to the cytokines and which ones and Mm -hmm. all these TNF-alpha and all these bad agents. What one is it for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. Well, you know what you're making me think, Steve, much like with other conditions, we focus so much on the neurons, but what about the glia? You know, microglia, obviously, are part of the the, uh, immune system there. And boy, the glia are so active. There's so much going on there. And we really don't think a whole lot about the glia as much. And I'm wondering if there are glial manipulations that would help here. Oh, I think you're onto something there. And, a, and, and another proof of what you just said is that whereas our monoamine neurotransmitters are almost entirely managed by neurons themselves, there's a mm-hmm. very important component of glutamate neurotransmission, which is dependent mm-hmm. on the synthesis recycling of glutamate itself mm-hmm. is involved. And so it's very possible that illnesses that are glutamate related, not the least of which, of course, is schizophrenia by current hypotheses, right. is a glial problem. It's not been proven, yep. but it's something to look at. Right. We tend to think they're silent. But as you mentioned, there's a type of glia, which is basically in the brain only. It's called a microglia, and it's kind of yeah. silent until it gets provoked. And then it starts mm-hmm. spitting out all sorts of inflammatory, pro-inflammatory mm-hmm. cytokines and so forth. So mm-hmm. that kind of glia, for sure, is something to think mm-hmm. of what activates it and what could cool it off. Yeah, they're kind of the macrophages of the brain, if you will, the macrophages being peripheral. But as you mentioned, I mean, for schizophrenia, you know, there are GLI-T1 inhibitors that are being studied, and that's working on the glia. And I've seen some others, some other, other drugs that are targeting the glia more than the neuron. So yeah, I think so if that's you got a, a sick glia frontier. that's triggering the degeneration of the nearby neurons, is that a plausible a pathway towards mm-hmm. understanding the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's? I don't know that it is, but I mean, no. I think that yeah. what happened is that if you fall in love with 
It's a little bit like you're finding out the scene of, of the suspects in a murder. Once you concentrate on the first one you <laughs> see, you know, you mm-hmm. may miss the real perpetrator. And maybe a little of that's mm-hmm. been done with this detective work so far. Yeah, well said. Well, you know, with the glia, there's abnormal activation of microglia, but there could be underactivity of the other glia that are very supportive. You know, I always think of them like, you know, the Tour de France, Steve, there's a bike rider, but there's always a van following along with them that's their support system. <laughs> that's how I think of some of the glia. And so clearly that could be part you of it. You sound like what I have to do when I go out jogging these days. <laughs> <laughs> Need to that's have right. my, uh, my ambulance following me, okay? So, yeah, the support sorry, team. But- Well, Steve, I got to say, though, I, Steve, is still smarter than almost anyone else. So you've got a little bit of extra horsepower there. Okay. So I think that we're all worried about it as we age. And, you know, we would like to have health span as well as lifespan. No, absolutely. Totally agree. Keeping up with the latest in psychiatry? shouldn't be a struggle. SynovianFieldMedical.com is a new website for clinicians where you can find a library of free, hand-selected resources, such as videos and infographics on important psychiatry topics. You can request an educational program for your practice or connect with Synovian medical professionals in your area. Synovian wants to help you get all of your psychiatry questions answered. Go to SynovianFieldMedical.com and explore what Synovian has to offer. Now, we talked about the fact that, obviously, if we think about the amount of money that's gone into Alzheimer's research, it really dwarfs anything else in psychiatry, certainly, that we do. And yet, the results so far have been very disappointing. Now, unfortunately, there was even a case uh, a few years back of some falsification, perhaps, of data. This involved the amyloid beta-56 controversy. What do you know about that? Well, some basic scientists, it's not clear if they did this on purpose or by accident. Mm -hmm. Some people think it was on purpose. What Mm -hmm. happened was that they showed that in a, a, I think it was a mouse model, that there was a disease mechanism that put amyloid as a cause of essentially a form of degeneration in, in an animal model. Now, it, it turns out that, that they really didn't show that because they put the wrong data mm-hmm. in the paper and they've been mm-hmm. accused of lying about it. And the reason yeah. for that is I think everybody was caught up in into, they fell in love with this hypothesis. And so you could get famous, you could get your paper cited, you could get more grant money if you confirmed what everybody already believed was true and which we are Absolutely now disputing true. on this call. And so somebody Absolutely. did that and got away with it. I think it was in 2006 and they just found it out recently. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's re- it's really a shame because, as you said, sometimes when you're blinded by this hypothesis, it just blinds you to the possibilities. It's really a shame that, that this happened. But again, it sort of shows you the rewards for finding something here will be tremendous. So there's all kinds of incentive to find something, anything. Well, the institutionalization costs of all the people who have Alzheimer's disease before they die is even yeah. more expensive than $26,000 a year of the infusions. Yeah. You know, and this particular research was never replicated. And that's really the hallmark of the scientific method is, you know, you need to replicate findings. That's why the FDA requires more than one positive study usually to approve a drug. You know, well, science is self-correcting. Uh, it can take a while. But if we keep taking amyloid out of the brain, it keeps not working. At some point, Mm -hmm. people will not believe it. There are a number of people who think we just aren't doing it early enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not doing it the right patients. And they may be right, too. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of findings from neuroimaging studies looking, let's say, at mood disorders or schizophrenia. You'll find one study that shows one thing and the other study that shows the opposite or something totally different. So it's very complicated. And again, I think we're dealing with heterogeneous biologic processes, aren't we? We're dealing with a heterogeneous thing here. There's many different ways probably ending up with what looks clinically like Alzheimer's. Right, exactly. Certainly we dementia. Because, and, I, and the other thing that's yeah. interesting, Andy, is there's no such thing as Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. What do I mean by that? Mm-hmm. They're all mixed. You know, uh, nobody has a pure amyloid problem in their brain. You will find a few Lewy bodies. You will find so a few strokes in almost any brain. Now, you may figure that those were silent, but they're there. And so when, you know, 
you actually look at brains of real people, there's a portfolio and a spectrum of how much amyloid you have, how many plaques you have, how many tangles you have, how many Lewy bodies you have. Mm -hmm. And so it's a concept that is not really a true one. That gets to my point about the heterogeneity. Perhaps we need to call this predominantly amyloid or predominantly Alzheimer's because it's really right. mixed, as you said. Um, so, yeah, I agree. We can't divide them into buckets. And really further evidence for this is the fact that there have been at least four genes that have been associated with Alzheimer's. Well, those four genes are each doing something a little different. So, again, there could be different pathophysiologies here. Well, I don't know what the status is yet of the, uh, the studies of the gene. <clears throat> you know, you can get a, a certain autosomal dominant gene in certain populations that will definitely, yeah. you know, cause you to have early Alzheimer's is a form of it that is, you know, That's right. you get in your 40s and your 50s. So it sounds like that particular illness, like you say, there are many causes of possibly late onset Alzheimer's disease. If that is actually <clears throat> blocked by not having amyloid, that, that actually sounds like it's plausible. But late onset, mm -hmm. the usual type and the much more common form of Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. is maybe some people have that gene or, you know, they have the ability to get better and stop their progress by stopping Alzheimer's, but the rest don't. Yeah, that's certainly true. You know, you just reminded me of the association between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. A very high percentage of patients with Downs develop Alzheimer's early in life, relatively early. Yeah, so exactly. that certainly could be a clue, something, a clue that could unlock some of this pathophysiology. But, you know, some of this is technology dependent. Steve, you mentioned back when you and I trained, the technology was pretty rudimentary and it's really come a long way. And that may allow us to further unlock some of the secrets here. I think you're right. And, you know, the, it's kind of always difficult when you have an illness that's based upon a real diagnosis that occurs after death, and then it's always yeah. mixed. So, yeah. you know, <clears throat> you can call it predominantly Alzheimer's disease, but the technology is going to help us with imaging. It's already, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some really good imaging stuff out there that, uh, that, mm -hmm. that shows that something is happening. So, Diagnostically, if you will, in terms of describing this illness and seeing what's happening to the living human that's demented, that's happening. Uh, now, whether that can help us figure out a treatment is now beginning to be more of a quandary. Well, it's true. And of course, it's so hard when so much of the action here is happening at a really microscopic level. It's just really hard. You have to make these inferences. And then the other problem, of course, is when we do preclinical work on animals, you know, the, the rat brain, the mouse brain is just not analogous in the, it, to the human brain, particularly in this kind of disease. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's a few lawyers and politicians that have brains that are closer <laughs> to rats than I, oh, anyway, sorry about that. But yeah, <clears> that wasn't very nice. But yeah, I think you're right that the, uh, the animal models, I mean, if you have already decided that at, amyloid is the problem and you create an animal model which causes a problem when you accumulate an amyloid and you block that, then, you know, it's a little bit of a tautology. You already set it up to, to be that way. So right. I think the, the moral of the story is you and I can be wrong in our skepticism and maybe this is one of the greatest in retrospect you know, breakthroughs in the field of Alzheimer's that we've ever seen, these last two antibodies, and we'll look as foolish as sometimes we do. And on the other hand, it could just be, you know, another bump in the road on the way to try to figure out what's really wrong. Well, I think you're right. I think the latter is really the point. You know, the other thing that I think we fell in love with was the idea of antibodies and of bio biologics and giving infusions to people. I think there's something about that just seems very sexy and very effective and very strong. Well, potent, shall I be cynical? Sure. Very profitable. Well, that too. You know, it, you know, the idea is that you can make a lot more money on a bag of antibodies that are infused once a month or once a week mm -hmm. or whatever than you can pill taken every day. And so yeah. the cost of these kinds of therapies are reimbursed, although I guess with new laws in negotiating Medicare prices, maybe that'll, you know, be less so in the future. So I think that, <clears throat> you know, the infusions are interesting and they... You wouldn't know. They really thought that an antibody could get in the brain, but somehow they do enough to actually literally suck the amyloid out. But there, there are problems with that. When the amyloid comes out, it's not always quiet. It's noisy. Yes. What do I mean by that? That's right. It it causes hole in the brain. It causes swelling, and it causes sometimes bleeding. Yes, you're referring to the arias, the 
amyloid-related right. imaging abnormalities, which really have plagued th these studies. They were really unanticipated. And usually, thank goodness, they're asymptomatic, but very significant percent of the time, they can be associated with significant side effects and symptoms. I've seen some of those in, in clinical trials I've been involved with. So these drugs right. are not, they're not totally benign. Well, there's amyloid in the blood risk. vessels. It's amyloid in the blood vessels. So you've right. got 80-year-old blood vessels that are friable and frail, and you That's pull right. a, a something out of it unceremoniously, you might basically shatter that vessel or cause it to leak. Yeah. And so, yeah. and like you say, the brain is kind of interesting because there's a lot of areas that look like they're kind of silent. And particularly when these areas occur in the back of the brain, you know, in the parietal mm -hmm. cortex or the you know, occipital mm -hmm. cortex, you see them in the back of the mm -hmm. brain. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. even know that they're there if you haven't taken a picture of them. But the, I guess the point would be that the brain rebels a little bit about the amyloid being sucked out of it. And <laughs> so it's one of the prices of doing business with this type of therapy. Yeah. See here again, I think we're just barking down the wrong tree here. I just feel like we need to figure out what's happening that leads up to this amyloid formation and attack at a much earlier phase. And that's where there's a lot of research going on too, Stephen. I'm hoping maybe that this is sort of the last gas, the last hurrah of the amyloid fascination, but I may be wrong. You know, it's I don't think there's a lot more antibodies one. in trials now, are there? Didn't most of them fail? Uh, there, maybe, maybe because of this, they'll dust yeah. off some of them on the shelf and Put them back into yeah. trials, but I don't think no. The a area lot that them. I've seen now are anti-tau antibodies. People are now switching over to tau, which again I think is too far down the road, to be honest. But I think well, we I'm going to make a bad joke here. Yeah. You know, beta amyloid protein, BAP, mm -hmm. and tau. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're mm -hmm. going to maybe see a reemergence of a war and the war between the Baptists and the Taoists. <laughs> oh, geez, that is a terrible joke. <laughs> Oh, sorry about but that. I think, We're trying to just wake uh, people up on right. this uh, podcast. I think, I think you're right. Yeah. But the Baptists have been winning so far, and the Taoists kind of went underground. And so now the Taoists are possibly, you know, raising. So the question is, if you can stop Tao formation, would this mm -hmm. actually be better for, you know, the Alzheimer's? <clears throat> right. Well, you know, hope springs eternal, I think. But I think we're going to have much more success with whatever the next round brings us. You know, it's interesting, that first drug that was approved, interestingly, Biogen was the company, and now this new one is ASI and Biogen together. So Biogen's pretty committed to this mechanism. But that first one, the FDA came under so much controversy for approving it. And finally, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid ended up not really paying for it. And now you can only get it paid for if you were someone involved in one of the clinical trials, which is... Small well, you think they're going to approve, Medicare is going to approve a payment for the new one? Very likely, there probably will be some restrictions placed on it, but I haven't heard as much back on this one yet. We'll have to see what happens. I think well, you know, that the first, the, yeah. well, the first drug, you know, went through the usual process of going to the Psychopharm Advisory Committee or the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. Advisory Committee, which is not part of the FDA, but advisors to the FDA, and they voted yeah. it down because right. there wasn't a clinical correlate to the amyloid getting out of the brain. Well, then, because of the things we've mentioned, the FDA bowed to pressure to approve on the basis of a surrogate endpoint. Amyloid going down was good mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole committee resigned in protest. Yes. And uh, yes. people, you know, this, it wasn't subtle. And then the Medicare wouldn't pay for it. Now what's happened right. with the new one is that they didn't even go to the advisory committee. And so they uh -huh. bypassed that to prevent oh, that, see. you know, problem. And they're going to be more likely because there is some slowing of progression at 18 mm -hmm. months. I think it was 27% right. slower. They still got worse slower, but they still got, but that's improvement. I mean, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. And so that may end up being enough. And they also, I believe their initial price on the first one was much more than $26,000. The new one, they're You're trying right. to justify and not right. just really kind of gouge too much. Not gouge and, as much. Because you look yeah. at the price of, you know, Ambrel and these other kinds of antibodies that are given all over the tough place for rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's and so forth. It's not a bad price. Mm -hmm. And so I just would say it's probably good if anybody listening here really wants to get on the bandwagon. If you've got a person with MCI and you get them an amyloid scan, However, you can get that and get that paid for, which is already problematic. You got amyloid in the mm -hmm. brain and a little bit of complaints, you can get this new drug. So mm -hmm. 
you know, the time to preserve the brain is before you've lost it all. So slowing progression from MCI to Alzheimer's would be a great thing. So I would think that's also going to be the most difficult because MCI obviously can be depression. It can be, you know, just normal aging and it might not get better with antibody removal of amyloid, but it's worth Mm -hmm. trying. And so those people are often functioning and they are living at home and Mm -hmm. so forth and it keeps them. Mm-hmm. you know, high quality of life, giving it to moderate Alzheimer's disease to prevent severe Alzheimer's disease. Maybe only if you're trying to keep people out of a nursing home. Maybe that's mm-hmm. the thing you see. You're yeah. trying to keep grandma in the back bedroom, as I said. Right. I think the other difference, though, between the aducanumab, the first one, was that the clinic, again, the clinical benefit was really small difference. And it was only seen in retrospect, when they reanalyzed the highest dose level only, and that wasn't the primary outcome group. So it was sort of hand-waving and and a retrospective cherry-picking of the data that showed any clinical benefit, whereas I think this one did show some benefit. The difference was less than half a point, actually, on the CDR, as I mentioned, rating scale, the CDR sum of boxes. So the question is, how are people going to get blood, and because people don't want spinal taps, but blood tests Mm -hmm. and or brain amyloid mm-hmm. scans in order to get access mm-hmm. to this. Yeah, um, there is actually, believe it or not, there is a, a serum biomarker now for amyloid. I don't know the exact sensitivity and specificity, but there is one available. PET scans, you can get a PET scan to look at amyloid. And apparently my understanding is they are getting paid for, particularly if coupled with some clinical uh, symptoms that would justify mm-hmm. it. You know, and well, the, there is the PET some scans with, with 2-deoxyglucose began to get mm-hmm. paid mm-hmm. for maybe 10 years ago. And so, listen, if you're sitting there with a little bit of memory problems, you got amyloid and an amyloid scan, you better start worrying. So, I mean, I think that, you know, if you can get it covered to get the scan, if you can get get this uh, new Mm -hmm. antibody covered, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd be worth doing. But we just want to make sure that Mm -hmm. people realize the it's not a slam dunk and that there could be these aria kinds of problems of taking the amyloid out of the brain Mm -hmm. and it might not work. Right. Well, I think the clinical implications of getting these scans are not so much to drive treatment, but can be very helpful, at least for predictive things. You know, if you know what kind of dementia you're dealing with here, you can essentially rule out Alzheimer's by saying there isn't enough amyloid. Obviously, frontotemporal is a different picture. Frontotemporal, as we all know, uh, you want to really avoid the D2 blockers. Those people are extremely sensitive to movement disorders with D2 blockers. If it's vascular dementia, you would go very aggressively against uh, cardiovascular risk factors. So there could be some treatment and clinical implications for doing those scans. Uh, Well, you know, you just said an early important thing, which is that if you throw the dice and you've got a little bit of memory problems and you don't have amyloid in your scan, thank Mm -hmm. your lucky stars, because it may very well not even be dementia, it certainly won't look like it's going to progress just on a statistical basis as likely at all to Alzheimer's disease. So negative amyloid scans in the presence of symptoms is something which is also very much of a relief. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So we have a lot to learn, and unfortunately, we have a long way to go. And we are, obviously, when the stakes are this high, Steve, there's going to be controversy. And there's going to be people who are going to jump to premature conclusions. There's money to be made, as you mentioned. Certainly, I know there's so many drug companies that are still going after this. And I'm also seeing a lot of smaller biotechs that are really, you know, interesting. Some of them are one-trick ponies. You know, they have sort of one theory, one compound, one mechanism. But boy, if one of those were to hit, you can imagine. Absolutely. Just a minute. So people listening here are going to get bombarded, perhaps, by knowledgeable patients that are going to ask about this and maybe insist on it, or their family members are going to say, can you get my father some of this new stuff? And you may want to do that, but to just go through a careful workup and, you know, does remove amyloid. And so, you know, getting access to it is going to, you know, change quite dramatically. I think the Medicare people, as of the date of this podcast, have not decided whether they're going to cover it. No, they have not weighed in yet. But Steve, you bring up something very important. And, you know, if it was my loved one, if it was my mom or my family member, I think I'd be willing to do a lot, almost anything, even if it's marginal benefit. I mean, look at the success of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and memantine. You know, they are given out 
routinely. It's very unusual to see an Alzheimer's patient who's not taking those. And those drugs also have very marginal benefit. Right. And so, and I think it's really the fact that they're even as a branded oral drug were a lot less expensive. So part of this has to do with a with right. an ex, a expense ratio. But, you know, yes. when it's your yes. father, you know, there's no amount of expense that should be spared in order to help him. Yeah, so most I of those that, drugs have you've gone... Most of the drugs have gone generic, you're right. So, but you're also right that there's, you would spare no expense. And so I think you're right. Clinically for our audience, you're going to be hearing about this. You're perhaps going to have family members, patients and families coming to you asking about this and asking for this. And so I think you're right, Steve, you have to do a pretty careful decision-making process. And some of it will depend on coverage and some of it will depend on what steps you have to take to get this to get to it? Do you have access to providing infusions in your clinic, for instance? Many psych clinics are now. They're dabbling with ketamine and things like that. So, and if the listeners are having patients or family members or, you know, patients of theirs coming forward and asking questions, you know, it's one thing to talk about very early onset and memory problems, but don't forget what we also briefly mentioned, and we've covered in other podcasts, some of the most disabling things that may not be memory, merely it may be some of these ancillary symptoms. Psychosis now looks like there could be treatments very close to occurring. Right now, it's mm -hmm. using drugs that are actually like antipsychotics that are not necessarily so safe. But then there's new treatments on the horizon. There's two drugs that are likely to be approved within a year for the agitation of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. And really, That's when right. grandma throws her tray on the floor at night or wanders and, you know, is making noise and disrupting the household, that kind of agitation is what gets her into the nursing home. And so That's those right. things are to keep in mind. They're on the horizon. So the help is on the way in many forms. And there is a lot of research going on. This will get sorted out and, you know, we'll have symptomatic treatments probably before we'll have really clear disease-modifying treatments, and maybe the disease-modifying treatments will figure out how to use them better. Yeah, well said, Steve. I think that's a nice summary and a nice coda here to wrap it up. I want to remind everybody, this is the first in a series we're going to be doing on this uh, topic in this kind of controversial area of Alzheimer's and treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So stay tuned. We're going to have a couple more podcasts in this series examining various aspects, and we hope to get some people even more knowledgeable than Steve and I on to enlighten us and to give us more points of view on how to think about this. And, you know, as clinicians, how do we deal with these patients and what can we tell these families to give them some hope, perhaps some realistic hope anyway? Well, Steve, that's all for today. Any final words of wisdom for our audience? No, just realize that we have a perspective on this. So we could be wrong. And we're going to invite people that are more bullish on these amyloid treatments to speak with us and keep up to date because science marches on and progress is being made. There's hope out there. Yeah. And we at NEI are committed to increasing our educational efforts and programs around these topics. So for more information, of course, you can go to our website at www.neiglobal.com and certainly check out our live meetings and our various other educational offerings. So I'm Dr. Andy Cutler, Chief Medical Officer of the Neuroscience Education Institute, saying goodbye for now. And again, please check out our other podcast offerings. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI Podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 